No deal on immigration and uncertainty for hundreds of thousands of young undocumented people living in the United States. I'm Vida Fakhri in Washington, D.C., with a special edition of Bigger Than Five, asking how best to fix America's immigration system. We'll hear from former Mexican President Felipe Calderón, who says his country won't give in to hate speech. Trump will pass, and we will prevail. We will stay here. President Trump is still pushing his border wall plan and deporting people who have lived in the United States since they were children. I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing, you know, but it's just that once, once Trump came, everything just went down. The president still has support among many voters, though, who say he is trying to make America safe again. I'm a Trump guy, I love the guy, and I think he's doing a hell of a job. But with promises of tough new rules, is this nation of immigrants turning its back on its own history? Hello from Washington, D.C. Well, the plan was clear. This was going to be the year when Donald Trump fixed America's immigration system. But after making it a top priority for 2018, his proposals seem to have hit a wall of their very own. Democrats and Republicans continue to argue, and court rulings are adding more delays. The deadlock is not helping the hundreds of people getting swept up in weekly deportation raids and the hundreds of thousands under constant threat of removal. So what is Trump proposing? The White House calls it a four-pillar plan. President Trump says he wants to give protection and a chance at citizenship to 1.8 million so-called dreamers. These young undocumented immigrants were brought to the U.S. as children. Many have been under threat since Trump changed the rules. In return, the president wants $25 billion to help build a wall on the border with Mexico. He wants to end the diversity lottery, which hands out 50,000 visas a year to people from countries with low rates of migration to the U.S. And he wants to limit family visas, which allow immigrants to bring in relatives such as parents and adult children. The president calls this chain migration. From his first month in office, immigration has been one of the key talking points of the Trump presidency. And on issues from the border wall to travel bans, immigration has turned into a battleground for the president and his critics. We're asking Congress to support our immigration policy that keeps terrorists, drug dealers, criminals, and gang members out of our country. We want them out. And right now, we're working on DACA, we're working on immigration bills, and we're making them tough. The first pillar of our framework generously offers a path to citizenship for 1.8 million illegal immigrants. It's time to begin moving toward a merit-based immigration system. When it comes to terrorism, we will do whatever is necessary to protect our nation. We will defend our citizens and our borders. We will make a long-term deal on immigration if and only if it's good for our country. Well, any future deal will come too late for the thousands already deported under President Trump, like 21-year-old Isaac Hernandez. Brought from Mexico as a child, he was removed from the United States after failing to renew his permit. We met him as he arrived back on Mexican soil, a young man who's gone from dreamer to deported. I was living in uh, Illinois, Chicago, before I got deported. They took my DACA away from me because I forgot to renew it. And right now with that uh, Trump situation, it's, it's bad. I was a dreamer, you know, I, I lost my DACA for that. I never thought it was gonna happen. Right, when I first arrived to the United States, I was maybe around six, seven years old. So I did all my life over there, not here. You know, so I'm, I don't, I'm new to all this. It's sad, you know, I had to leave uh, people behind too, you know. It's not right. 
I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing, you know, but it's just that once, once Trump came, everything just went down. The patients are getting harder. Yeah, I'm trying to be uh, in a happy mood, see uh, what comes my way, keep my head up high, you know, and just keep moving in life, you know, like, I know one day I'm, I'm gonna go back over there. Well, the tough approach to people like Isaac might have won President Trump some support, but it's prompted plenty of concern and criticism too. Former Mexican President Felipe Calderón is just one of the people speaking out. I went to meet him in Mexico City where he told me Trump's treatment of Mexicans has been racist and threatens to damage America's own economic interests. I believe migration is one of the largest and complex phenomena of our time, either in Turkey or Mexico, it's, uh, it's quite complex. But the point is, we need to deal with that reality. I believe in law and the rule of law, and we need to find a way in which that natural or demographic phenomenon could be fit in terms of legal mechanism. But, but do you think in a way that uh, Trump's boisterous, shocking rhetoric when it comes to immigration may in fact in the long run help Mexican immigrants and Mexicans in that this constituency has such levers of power that it yes. can utilize to its benefit. And I can say that, but let me give you one example. President Trump's son has a vineyard in the United States. And last year he was asking to the American government to allow him to hire Mexican workers. And his argument was, I cannot find American workers to work in my vineyard, you no? Know? And that is happening with the American economy. I can assure you, half of the, of the workers in the agricultural sector are immigrants. But what happens to these so-called dreamers? These people whose parents came from Mexico and other countries without documentation, the so-called illegal immigrants, the children of these people consider themselves American. They came to the country when they were toddlers, children. They've been allowed to stay under a plan that Obama put in place, which Trump has vowed to disrupt and to dismantle. What happens to them if they are deported back to Mexico, many of them? What should Mexico do? First, well, first, it's, it's completely unfair to those kids. You cannot blame them about the situation. They have nothing to do with that. Now, they are part Mexican and part American, as you, was, you were saying, they consider their, themselves as, as American. Most of them, for instance, speak English, but maybe some of them doesn't speak, don't speak Spanish. Like, but going to that, Mexico should open its arms. We, the Mexicans, should open our arms to all those kids. But all those kids, or should you look at them on an individual basis? Because we're, talk we're talking about hundreds of thousands, 700, 800,000. Yeah, it's difficult. The majority of them from Mexico. How do you take them in, though, without being sure of their Mexican citizenship? Well, let me, one thing. Uh, there is a uh, traditional joke in which uh, you say, if somebody knows how to sing the national anthem, then he or she is Mexican. So that, that could be, a, that's the well, test. of course, that could be the, the very same case with his or her passport, for instance. It's, that is not the problem. It's a problem for the country to receive such a, an overwhelming number of people overnight, yes. However, first, Mexico needs to fight for those kids in the American Congress and in the American public opinion, and even in front of the American, pre American presidents. Second, if that is the case, that that incredible unfair measure could be taken, we need to see that, that there will be a lot of downsides in this part, how to allocate them, how to receive them, where, with who. However, in my opinion, there could be some upside in that. Because it's my point, they are the best and the brightest, quite, quite well-educated people, respecting the law, uh, hardworking or hard-studying people, the best and the brightest. And so the Americans are losing those kids and they could be winning them. Did you, do you see it more as a Republican issue? Do you think Democrats would have carried on in the Obama tradition? And having said that, I should just point out that Obama himself actually deported a lot of illegal migrants did, yes. very quietly though. So is Trump being sort of singled out unfairly just simply because of his boisterous rhetoric when the policy has been the same pretty much? Not to say, but there is a quite important thing. I respect 
any American president following or fulfilling his duty. So of course the law, it's quite difficult to us to understand that part, but I understand that. But what is completely unacceptable is the fact this flavor of a racism or anti-Mexican feeling or blaming we the Mexicans about the problems of the Americans. I know there was a horrible economic crisis in 2008, 2009, because failures in the financial American system. But now Trump and other people pretend to blame the Mexican people about their own problems, and that's completely unfair. So in other words, I understand and I respect the right of any single government to enforce their own laws. We respect and we support the Mexican people who have, who have human rights there, but which is completely rejectable is the fact to establish this flavor of uh, races, this flavor of anti-Mexican issues. How do you see this issue being resolved, this immigration issue between the two countries? You know, uh, it's important to emphasize that uh, the immigration ratio of Mexican workers to the United States since the year 2010 is either zero or negative, meaning there are more Mexican workers coming back to Mexico than the other way around. Of course, in politics, every time that we have election, they will raise the voice against the Mexicans because it's quite easy. So do you think it's a lot of noise, but eventually there will be a solution I the, in everyone's sooner interest? Sooner or later, the, the economic reality will impose itself. The problem is if, if, we, if you create a gap between the reality and demagogic speeches, the people in the United States or in Mexico will, 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 will suffer a lot. But do you feel that relations can be restored between the two countries? Because talking to a lot of Mexicans here, people really are angry. Okay. You with cannot the live with a neighbor like Mexico, gaining hate and hate and hate. No, somebody needs to call the American society and government to rationality again. No? But hopeful? meanwhile, well, we need to work on that. The damage is there, definitely, yes. But we cannot stop our activities. We cannot say, well, we have very bad luck and we had this terrible president as a neighborhood, as a neighbor, but uh, we need to work on that. We need to continue. And uh, let me repeat to you, Trump will pass and we will prevail. We will stay here. That was former Mexican President Felipe Calderon speaking to me in Mexico City. So, on both sides of the border, there are heated views on immigration, often fueled by inflammatory statements. But the statistics tell a different story to the sound bites. James Champion has our five facts. One, the US has more immigrants than any other nation. In a population of 323 million, more than 43 million are immigrants. That's 14% of the total. Add the US-born children of immigrants, it's 27%. Two, immigrants are a major factor in the workforce. Around one in six workers is an immigrant. Sectors like agriculture, manufacturing, and domestic work rely on them. One study found that without immigrants, the US workforce would shrink significantly over the next 20 years. Three, immigrants are less likely to commit crime. One study found the imprisonment rate for US-born people is far higher than both undocumented and documented immigrants. 4. A wall won't stop most illegal immigrants. There are people who cross the border illegally and those who overstay their visas. But since 2007, there have been 600,000 more overstays than illegal entries. 5. More immigration could save the government money. Changing laws to let in more people doesn't come cheap, but also means more tax income and wealth creation through new businesses. Under failed reforms from 2013, an extra 9 million people would have been given the right to live in the US. But according to the official cost estimate, that would have reduced the budget deficit by $175 billion over 10 years. 
Plenty to talk about with our guest. Mark Krikorian is executive director at the Center for Immigration Studies, a group that advocates for lower immigration into the United States. And Ophelia Calderon is an immigration lawyer and advisor to the Council of Legal Aid Justice Center. Uh, Ophelia, to you first, as the daughter and granddaughter of immigrants, this debate must seem particularly personal to you, in addition to the fact that you are an immigration lawyer and represent quite a few of these so-called dreamers. How deep and far-reaching have the effects of this immigration debate been? I think it is personal. I mean, obviously, it affects me on a professional level and it affects me on a personal level. You nailed it. Um, I am um, the multi-generational multi product of immigrants. Um, and more importantly, I think that a lot of the anti-immigration push from in recent, this, this year in any event, um, ha has felt like there is an, a racial animus there, which I think um, goes deeper into our society and our, into our community and creates a line that I think is personal. Mark Krikorian, is there any denying that there is a racial and a racist element to this discussion? Yeah, but I mean, there's no issue that doesn't have some kind of racial issue to it. Quite frankly, even the pro-immigration side has tinges of racial triumphalism in it. The question is, what are the policy issues? What, what policies are going to be best for our country and our grandchildren going forward? And that's, you know, the other stuff are distra distractions. But, but uh, as policy, you've strongly opposed uh, what you've called mass immigration. But we're not talking about mass immigration here, are we? We're talking about so-called dreamers, people who've been brought into this country since they've been children, people who consider themselves American, why shouldn't they be allowed to stay? Plus, they haven't broken any laws. They've been law-abiding. Uh, like most Americans, I'm actually for legalizing dreamers. Let's make it clear, though, it's not small. We're talking from one to three million people, potentially. So it's not as though it's just a handful of people. But you've, but, but you've argued that the DACA program that the, Obama put in place is unconstitutional. Right. The DACA program, the way it was done through a presidential decree, was, in fact, illegal. The real policy question is whether it's a good idea for Congress to pass real laws that would legalize or amnesty the people who really did grow up here from childhood, not who came as teenagers, but who came as children, have gone through school here. I'm for that. The question is, what measures will balance it to make sure we don't have another million or two million dreamers five or ten years from now? But, but Obama would argue that it was at his prosecutorial discretion that he was able to change this and defer action on DACA. A as a lawyer, well, though, Ophelia, do you think there was an original sin there by Obama and that he should have pushed, pushed harder for Congress to pass proper legislation? OK, I, I mean, I, I think that there are many topics that just came up here. I mean, I, I don't think that the, the DACA program is unconstitutional. Um, the, the idea of deferred action is not a new one. Um, it's in the statute. The fact that Obama, you know, instituted a type of deferred action for a specific group of people is no different from, say, temporary protective status, which is also there. We also used to have something called um, defer, deferred enforced departure. Changing the words doesn't make it illegal or not legal. I mean, this is something that was part of our statute. To the point about changing, about to the point about whether or not we should have some sort of actual reform. Of course, that's true. Um, to the point about amnesty, I think that amnesty is sort of a word that we use to vilify the legalization of, of residents of our community. And I 100% agree with Mark to the extent that something else has to happen, um, and that something else does need to be congressional, but that's, that means that we need to really look at what this immigration issue is really about. I mean, our immigration system is broken. It was written in like 1952, the original, the Immigration and Nationality Act as it exists today doesn't reflect our economy or our people or what's happening. But that's not necessarily, A, the fault of these dreamers. And it's not solved or not solved by de deportation it, it, of mass well, families. It, it, and as you mentioned, this has been happening almost forever. Since the days of Ronald Reagan, there's been a policy of deferred action for the economic well, benefit of this country. No, Let me just remind ourselves of what Ronald Reagan said back in 1981, before going back to you, Mark Krikorian, this is what he said. He said, our nation is a nation of immigrants. More than any other country, our strength comes from our own immigrant heritage and our capacity to welcome those from other lands. Is this all changing now? Because it sounds quite opportunistic to have used the immigrants for an economic purpose all these years. To build your country, you To mean? build the country well, the and now turning is, your back again The fact is them. we've had high levels of immigration for long periods of our history, and we've had low levels of immigration for other periods of our history. This is not, immigration is a federal government program. 
And what I'm talking about is simply downsizing that federal government program. Um, this is now beyond this DACA issue in a broader sense, downsizing it to the very level we had when President Reagan made those comments. We now, we last year, we took 1.2 million people from abroad. We gave green cards to 1.2 million people. There's, that's not a magic number. There's no reason it shouldn't be 700,000 or six or 800,000. This is a regular policy but, issue but it's like farm subsidies Trump, should it go no, higher or lower. But farm is actually doing well, much more than this and that he's actually deporting a lot of people, including the targeting. But if you have it's limits, also the targeting. if I mean, you have limits, the limits have to be enforced. But if you have limits and the limits have to make sense, they have to, you know, they have to be sensible and they have to be something that's in line with our constitution, which means that it can't incorporate racial animus. Well, and so, I mean, we need to be careful with that. Well, I mean, Obama, but the fact Obama, is the Obama overwhelming Obama. majority of immigrants, of, of illegal immigrants, the overwhelming majority from Latin America. You can't enforce immigration law without most of the people bearing the brunt of that immigration enforcement being Latin American. It's just math. There's no way to avoid that. Well, when you're talking about illegal immigration, are we talking only about people who come over the border? Or we are talking about these individuals who come and overstay? But, but, but the line was Both. often blurred during Both. the campaign, it's fair to say, isn't it? Because quite often, President Trump just mentioned immigrants. It's not just blurred by President Trump. It's blurred by people on the other side as well, where the word immigrant is routinely used when a news story, for instance, is specifically about illegal immigrants. So this is a broader problem. This isn't just something Trump made up and we should but, all complain but should, about. But should law enforcement, though, be going after uh, these uh, dreamers, uh, dreamers and these immigrants and deporting hundreds of thousands of them, separating many of them from their mothers for no apparent reason, for, for, for no dreamers, specific reason, except, except, except to deter those who would be coming in? Dreamers are not being targeted. They are getting arrested sometimes. Mm -hmm. The priorities that the Obama administration put in place are actually similar to what we have now. It's just that under Obama, if you didn't meet these priorities, you weren't a criminal, you didn't have an outstanding deportation order that you fled from, that you were, in a sense, almost exempt from immigration law. But Obama uh, went after people who had committed crimes, not after students. I mean, I don't and think it's accurate who, to say that you were exempt from immigration law. I think it's the head more of ICE accurate to said say you were that, exempt from immigration law. Well, that's Obama. not how it happens in real life. And since I practice, um, I can tell you that that's not how it happens in real life. That people are affected by this. That dreamers are in fact arrested. That people are in fact taken into custody. That people. And you know, the idea that one of the things that I think the administration as a whole, and I would say, let's just be clear about this: it is not only the Trump administration, right? That even under Obama, when I says on a when I says that we're only targeting criminal aliens, that's completely untrue. They are not only targeting criminal aliens. I mean, when you have situations where an ICE officer targets a woman who goes into a courtroom to obtain a protective order, she herself is the victim of domestic violence, and ICE is there to pick her up, you are not picking up a criminal alien. You are picking up a, a victim of a criminal activity. Who in almost every case is somebody who had a deportation order eight or 10 years ago that they ignored. So they're actually fugitives from the law. The question, the, the point that you were making was that these people were, the, or the point that was being made was that they were targeting criminal aliens not, and that's not the But case. they're not even saying that. They're saying criminal aliens, fugitives from justice, and recent arrivals, people who just arrived. And that's still who's being targeted. It's just that now, if. For instance, ICE goes into a house, there's a, somebody who's been deported twice, he's a felon when he comes back automatically. If there's two other illegal immigrants there, they arrest them too. Under That's Obama, Colorado. they let them go. What, what, t let's talk a little bit about the estimates, because, Ophelia, there's a lot of numbers and figures floating around. The White House says uh, uh, 9 million immigrants would come into the U.S. via what Republicans like to call chain migration, yeah. which to a lot of other people just means family, family. reunification. What are the numbers? Is this fact or fiction? Nine million people would come in? I, I think that number is fiction, and I think that the word chain migration is yet another example of creating a false narrative um, to negativize, basically, um, what really is family reunification. And I see that all the time, where people ask me about this so-called chain migration, and they talk to me about how you shouldn't be able to bring your cousin, and you're such and such. And let's just be clear, you cannot. You cannot petition for your cousin. I mean, the family members that you can bring to the United States are your parents, your children under the age of 21, and sometimes your children over the age of 21, um, and your siblings, siblings right? And, and there is a, of course, spouses. Right. Yes, of course. So there's no great aunts, there's no cousins. But, but the fact but, is, your cousin and aunt and uncle do end up coming. 
It's just that there's no category for them. They end, they up coming two links down well, the chain. Well, many will say this is all very is ironic, though, and hypocritical when President Trump himself but is the, uh, the descendant of immigrants, not to mention his wife who came here on a visa policy. and whose parents... So that line visa. is also very long. Immigration policy needs to be about what's good for our grandchildren not what's worked out for our grandparents. And well, the question I would argue is, is that this it... good policy or isn't it? But That's a just... legitimate debate. I mean, Ophelia can say, these are the family categories we should give preference to. Okay, that's plausible, but, but why not cousins? But let me, why not but, let me, but beyond that, let me also ask you, is this good for America and America's image uh, throughout the world? Because America, as you know, has long been the, the beacon We're of hope. We're taking a meeting now. For many immigrants and people seeking asylum, well, right now it is changing that. In fact, I want to mention as well, since we're on this uh, topic, uh, the fact that the reference to a nation of immigrants has been removed from the website of the Immigration Service, the, the uh, mission. USCIS. It used to say... It was part of the mission statement of USCIS. ...that the agency, according to its mission statement, secures America's promise as a nation of immigrants by providing accurate and useful information to our customers and ensuring the integrity of our immigration system. Now it only refers to, quote, the nation's lawful immigration system. Is this good for America? It's good for America. Whether it's good for America's image abroad is really of little interest it to me. Matter. The question is, what is good for our citizens and those legal immigrants that we've admitted to become citizens in the future? Reducing, for instance, let's say we reduce immigration to uh, 700,000 a year the highest level of any country in the world still, even at that lower level, which would be something like 40% less than it is now. How is that somehow a, a negation of a immigration history? We're always going to have immigration. The, just as we're always gonna have foreign policy and we're gonna have education policy, these are government policies. It's just a question of should they be reformed and streamlined and downsized. But, but, but are you but okay, numbers, I think, are not, they're, they're not entirely accurate because the reality is, as when people say, like, oh, you can bring your brother and sister, I mean, you need to understand and remember that that line is a lengthy one. Sure. That these people stand in line. I mean, literally, Many for some long. people, it's like 24 years yep. in some particular countries. But, I mean, to your, to your other point about whether or not this is good for our children, I mean, I would argue that the inability, for example, Okay, so we've 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 established that I am the product of multi generational immigrants, right? I'm as a fifth I. generation Mexican American. My mother's a I'm a first as generation are most Chinese, Americans. as are most sure. Americans. Right. And you know, I happen to be married to somebody else who also is a foreign national, a Spaniard. I would argue that it is in my children's best interest to be able to have the capacity to maintain a fa familial relationship with my husband's family. Now, I'm not sure that they plan on coming here. They're from Spain. They seem they seem happy right there but i mean why would i why would i not be able to bring my my children's grandmother well let me this say is this. A, this is a good it, question and the fact is mm -hmm. family we have to decide what family relationships we want to privatize the immigration decision we want to privatize because family immigration means the american people don't decide who comes and joins them we we delegate to individual people to decide on their own that's a powerful authority, privilege, that in my opinion should be limited to husbands, wives, and little kids. That's it. We're going to have to leave it here, I'm afraid. A very heated debate, uh, no doubt, uh, that we can hopefully pick up some other time. But for now, thank you both very <laughs> much you. indeed. You're welcome. Ophelia Calderon and Mark Krikorian. Still ahead, no longer on the fringes, how far-right and anti-immigration parties are changing politics and rewriting laws in other Western democracies. Welcome back. Donald Trump's long road to the White House began with a tirade against Mexican immigration. Announcing his candidacy, he denounced Mexicans as rapists and criminals. That kind of language might have killed other campaigns, but it won him an immediate following. We spoke to two supporters who still like what they are hearing from Trump. They consider themselves the president's men. When Donald Trump came along, I agreed with him from the very beginning. When he, since he rode down the escalator, I, I said, that's my man. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Jerry is, is my head sign guy. He's done everything. You know, we, not only do we fish together, we share politics. When I, left, when I left him, I knew he was going to be one of the best presidents ever served this office. 
He offered the Democrats a heck of a deal where he was going to more than double the amount of people that he was going to take care of in the DACA deal, give them a path to citizenship. I know he don't want them to leave, but they got to be, you know, like start paying taxes and working. You know that he's going to build a wall. There's no two ways about it. He'll get it done here. He might not get it done this year, but he'll get it done. The people that come from out of the country, they want to interview them or have somebody interview them and make sure they're good, decent people, they're gonna come here and work and pay taxes and, and be a part of the community. The only thing that he said is that you, you have to vet the people. You don't, you don't wanna be shopping and all of a sudden the store blows up. You, you know, that's not our way of life. I'm a Trump guy, I love the guy, and I think he's doing a hell of a job. Well, President Trump may have set out his vision for immigration reform, but it is Congress that must make it happen. Several different proposals have been launched in recent weeks, but so far with little sign of progress. One member of Congress who's been working on reform is Republican Tom Reed. He is co-chair of a bipartisan group called the Problem Solvers Caucus. I met him here in Washington to get his views on the difficult problem of immigration reform. We, as a Problem Solvers Caucus, those 48 members equally divided between Democrat and Republicans, have been able to, to come to a consensus. Uh, we have a 75% rule within the caucus that says if we get to 75%, we will vote as a bloc uh, to solve the problem before us. And on immigration, we were able to get there. And I think we are reflective of members who want to govern, who want to get to yes. And if we can deploy that uh, on the floor of the House and in the Senate, I think we could solve this. But how much is it helping or hindering the process, the fact that President Trump seems to be flip-flopping on the issue? One of, the, one of your own colleagues, uh, Republican Congressman Peter King, called it zigzagging, something like a pinball machine. Yeah, well, knowing the President very well, and, and I appreciate uh, at times his style, uh, his disruptive style that he brings to this table, but he's willing to take this issue on. And I think what he also did, though, was by setting a deadline, uh, he, he actually put the most amount of pressure he could on Congress to get as close as we did to trying to solve this uh, But he about changes two ago. his mind a lot in the sense that he said in September that he wanted to reform, in fact, even stop Obama's DACA pro program. Then he said that he was willing to sign whatever compromise legislation can be crafted, only to go back a few days later and say, no, he won't. How do you deal with this type of uncertainty well, and confusion, in fact, contradictory statements? Well, uh, what you have to do is recognize uh, maybe where the ma major roadblock is on this issue, and that's in Congress. That is in the Senate and the House. And what he is indicating is he wants to have this dealt with legislatively, not by executive order. He wants to have this taken care of from us in the House and the Senate. And we got very close with 54 votes. Who is mostly to blame? Which part, which part know, of the aisle? When I, uh, I don't blame uh, sides of the aisle. What I blame is the gridlock and extremism of Washington, D.C. The left and the right are beholden to their extreme bases in their parties, and that is that is stopping so many of these issues from being solved. What about the president himself, though? Would you say he's also engaging in that type of posturing? In fact, maybe even an extremist behavior by, by adopting the positions he has on immigration. Being a New Yorker, uh, I understand the style uh, that he brings to the table. Uh, he does, and he's said it publicly before, chaos is kind of one of the tools he deploys. He puts you on your heels so he knows where the positions are. And I see it as more of a negotiating style, not, not an action of extremism. And I will tell you, if any president that I've met uh, is an ideologue, it's not President Trump. Uh, he is willing to cut a deal. Uh, he is not beholden to ideology. But if not an extremist, how would you describe him? I would say unique and a disruptor. A disruptor. So where does he leave in his style of, of, of disrupting the process? Where does it leave you in Congress, your Republican colleagues and those on the Democratic side who want to resolve this issue, not to mention the hundreds of thousands of dreamers and immigrants who are in a state of limbo? I mean, how much longer can they wait? Well, that's why I, I believe uh, inaction is not the appropriate response. And in our district, I have 200 uh, folks that are in the DACA program. Uh, of those 800,000 uh, children that you're referring to. And from my perspective, you know, that, that shows hopefully that I'm committed to solving this problem, not because of the, the thousands of people that are potentially impacted in our district, because we just don't have them, but it's the right thing to do. And in the meantime, what does this uh, extremism in your own terms, what does it say about the future direction that America has taken? This nation of immigrants, built by immigrants that has prospered uh, as a result of immigrants being in this country, literally turning its back on its own history. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't see it that way. Uh, how I see it is, you know, we are recognizing in America uh, that we need to fix our immigration policies. We need to fix our borders to make sure that they're functioning and also fulfilling what borders uh, for purposes of countries do is to keep us safe as one of our primary missions. So bottom line, we still welcome all. I'm the son of an immigrant, uh, proud son of an immigrant uh, who came here as a cabin boy on a steamship as a 16 year old young man. Uh, that I'm living the American dream. I want to share that dream with everyone, and that's why I step up to the plate to lead on this issue to try to come up with a sol to solve this problem of immigration before us. And do you feel that Trump's plan to build a wall will actually make the U.S. safer or less? Uh, I, I believe that having a, a functioning border, uh, which includes things like a wall, structures, technology, is part of the security mechanisms that any country uh, would expect its government to do to keep it safe. And that is something that I, I think is a common sense type of approach I bring uh, to the equation. And I think really members who are sincere about this, who want to solve this problem, recognize the threat at the border. They want to fix it, but they also want to make sure that it's functioning so that our immigration population can grow. But some recent polls suggest that the majority of Americans actually reject the idea of the wall. They're not in favor of it. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the polls that you're exactly citing, but I will tell you, if you talk to any American citizen about a border uh, security measure to keep us safe because of the threats that are around the world that are trying to harm not only America but the rest of the world, um, I think there's realization that we need that type of security measure, be it a wall, be it a structure, be it technology, uh, all of the above, I think, is what most Americans support. But doesn't this risk turning America into some kind of a gated community? I don't see that at all. I see uh, America just being what America's always been, a safe, secure place to come to enjoy the American dream and give your kids a better opportunity than what you find it in your home country. And you mentioned earlier that President Trump has a unique uh, negotiating style. As a congressman, do you feel that it is fair that he would bring in the issue of uh, securing funding for his proposed border wall in exchange for any deal on immigration? I think that's just being realistic. Uh, in order to get that coalition of 60 in the Senate and 218 in the House, uh, recognizing that if you can bring people to the table that maybe their priority uh, is border security, uh, but at the same time willing to address the children and vice versa, that's bring, bringing together a bipartisan coalition. And the best policy out of Washington, D.C. that I found in my history here, as well as history itself, is bipartisan legislation that withstands the test of time. Finally, Congressman, uh, your thoughts are on, on the way forward. How soon do you think this will be resolved? How, how hopeful are you? Uh, I, I'm hoping sooner rather than later, uh, but realistically, we're probably going to, it's being tied up into that extremism and partisan, partisan politics. 2018 may be the, the, the election we have to wait and see. Uh, to what the outcome is to get a finish line for this for Maybe this even the presidential election in 2020? That's a possibility too, but my hope, my hope, is sincere hope is no. Uh, I hope we get this done sooner rather than later, and I can only offer my own leadership in our office is saying we want to get it done now, not then. Congressman Tom Reed, thank, thank you, you very so much. much indeed. Thank Thanks you. Sir. The thoughts of uh, Congressman Tom Reed speaking to me on Capitol Hill. Well, immigration is a burning issue, not just here in the United States, of course, in a host of Western democracies, anti-immigration slogans and policies have won parties support and sometimes won them power. In many cases, they have gone from far right to center stage, as Tatiana Anderson explains. In an era when the movement of refugees and migrants has reached record levels, anti-immigration feelings are reshaping laws and policies. In France, it's been a huge political issue. Far-right leader Marine Le Pen was runner-up in last year's presidential election. Je refuse totalement les immigrés qui ne veulent pas reconnaître l'autorité du droit et de la culture française. And now the election winner, President Emmanuel Macron, wants a new law that will tighten controls over immigration to France, speed up deportations, and tighten asylum rules. His own party has even called it repressive. In the Netherlands, just over one in five people now has a foreign background. But immigration, integration, and national identity have been key talking points. The far-right Freedom Party of Geert Wilders came in second in last year's election. He wanted fewer Moroccans, a tax on hijab-wearing women, and to pay Muslims to leave the country. The Netherlands ours again. Sounds extreme. But now the ruling coalition formed to keep Wilders out is proposing new restrictions on immigration. In Hungary and Austria, far-right parties are in government. Hungary built a fence to keep out refugees. Illegal border crossings can be punished with three years in jail. Prime Minister Viktor Orban says Europe is being overrun. 
Austria's Freedom Party is now in the ruling coalition, which has plans for financial sanctions on immigrants who don't integrate with mainstream society. In neighboring Germany, migration has been a defining factor since 2015. That's when a million Syrian refugees arrived through Chancellor Angela Merkel's open door policy. It led to a surge in support for the far right alternative for Germany party, now the country's third largest. AFD is set to be the main opposition voice as Merkel struggles to put together a new coalition government. Well, let's get more now from our guest here in Washington is Christopher Hull, executive vice president at the Center for Security Policy. And in London, Sasha Polakosorowski, the author of Go Back to Where You Came From, a book about immigration and politics. Sasha, it isn't just about France, the Netherlands, Hungary, Poland, Germany, you name it. But recently, Italy uh, and um, uh, almost half of the Italian electorate gave thumbs up to far-right, anti-immigration, populist parties. Is this cross-Atlantic, anti-immigration wave simply likely to continue? I think that the Italian election is, is the clearest sign we've had in a while that this isn't going away. There was a lot of celebration after the Dutch election and after the French election, and a lot of people arguing, oh, the populist wave has passed. Marine Le Pen lost, Hirt Wilders lost in Holland. But what we've seen in Italy is that this isn't going away and that the sentiments that have been driving all of these parties are still there. And the fact that a party like the Northern League, now just the League, can gain votes in the South in an area of Italy that they used to ridicule is quite remarkable. And so I think that the general argument that all of these populist right-wing parties are making has real resonance uh, with populations in Europe. And what they've done very effectively is to conflate refugees who are in many cases fleeing terrorism with terrorists who are committing heinous acts in Europe. And that has caught on in the public mind. Uh, this equation of, of desperately fleeing refugees with terrorists who are committing horrible acts, that's caught on with the public. And politicians like Le Pen, politicians like Salvini, have been able to argue that letting any more people into Europe is going to lead to more terrorist attacks. And that, of course, is nonsense. But it has caught on with the public, and it's translating into votes. Well, well it's, it's a sure way, it seems, like Christopher Hall, of getting votes these days with politicians and parties who take a tough stance on immigration all but guaranteed to win at the polls. Just looking at the United States, while the Russian connection obviously is under investigation, many people would actually perhaps argue that it is more Mexico than Russia that swayed the election, in that the very colorful, many would say, perhaps even a shameless campaign that Donald Trump ran against immigrants swayed the election in his favor. Do you agree? Uh, I don't agree with your premise, nor do I agree with uh, what Sasha just said. In fact, it's provably false. The fact is that um, between 2014 and 2015, during the surge of immigrants that took place, the illegal immigrants that, uh, that surged into Europe, um, the terror strikes increased by 15 times. The number of deaths, I should say, the number of deaths increased 15 times. It went from about 10 to 150. And that number has remained relatively constant since. Immigrants have accounted for about 95% of the deaths associated with terror. It's fine if people would like to pretend that we're just making all of this up, that conservatives are making it all up, that the parties are making it all up, but the people in Europe and America absolutely agree it's just true that we're allowing people to come into Europe and come into America who are dangerous. They are committing crimes. They are committing terror well, strikes. Well, and but, if you want to you continue know, to deny it, you not can. At all, but, look, but that's why you, these parties are winning. American organizations deny it. The National Academy of Sciences says, and I quote, far from immigration increasing crime rates, studies demonstrate that immigrants and immigra immigration are associated inversely with crime. But let me then take the conversation back to Europe, since you mentioned the whole security uh, perspective and, and terrorism being perpetrated in Europe by immigrants. Uh, true or false, uh, Sasha, as far as you can tell? And how much is that feeding into the fears that are being stoked uh, toward immigrants? Well, I think it absolutely is a cause of fear. And people are right to be afraid of terrorist attacks in any country where they happen. 
The argument that I'm making is that if you look at these terrorist attacks and look at who has committed terrorist attacks in European countries, most of them are EU citizens. They are not people who've recently arrived from Syria fleeing war. So we have two different debates going on here. One is about whether refugees who are fleeing war have a right to seek asylum in European countries. And another debate is about what needs to be done to better integrate people who were born in France or Belgium or Holland and have not been properly integrated and have in some case joined radical groups. They have committed crimes, but they are not refugees, and we should not be conflating the two in the way that Marine well, Le Pen and other politicians let's have. Let's get Christopher to, to respond to this, because by erecting walls and keeping out so-called uh, criminals and, and putting in place travel bans, I mean, are you doing anything to, to help yourselves in terms of uh, adding the level of security that America wants? You know, it's funny, because I, I noticed that we have walls here, and the reason that we have walls here is because walls work. The, the walls that have been erected in places like Israel have cut dramatically the problems that they've had with, um, with uh, Sharia supremacist um, terrorists coming, coming through those, uh, those areas. But there's it, a false a, logic a, to this, isn't there? Because no, you heard there Sasha, you actually, heard Sasha but, just mention, and the evidence again suggests that a lot of people committing these crimes are, are here EU legally. Citizens. They are, are here legally. EU's, Even in the case EU of San Bernardino, let me just are, say, on, you have two on. suspects. One, a U.S.-born citizen of Pakistani descent. The other, a Pakistani-born lawful resident of the United States. So Both even in this sure case, a wall or a travel ban would not have kept them out. Uh, here's the problem. The problem is that you are trying to, you're trying to have it both ways. If the argument is we can't have anybody come into the country, uh, uh, or we should let everybody into the country because nobody's going to commit crimes and nobody's going to commit terror, well, first of all, that, that doesn't actually hold up under, uh, under examination. But no Second one's saying of all, we should allow everybody. Well, th that's the question, really, But you shouldn't keep should everyone out on in? the basis of their religion or ethnicity, either. We should not, I, I totally agree with you, we should keep them out if they are Sharia supremacists. That is, if they believe, as, by the way, 99% of those from Afghanistan do, and 91% of those from, uh, uh, from Iraq do, that Sharia should be imposed on you, then they should not be allowed into the United States or into the EU, period. What do you say to this type of uh, uh, narrative, Sasha? Have you, how much of this have you heard uh, during the research that you did when you said that uh, covering immigration was like constantly chasing a moving target, yet you said that you wanted to hear both sides of the debate. To what extent does this type of rhetoric and the rhetoric that you've heard from anti-immigration politicians uh, sway you? Well, I did spend a lot of time with people who hold these views, and I heard over and over again that a Muslim can never be French, a Muslim can never be Dutch. So I think that this debate tends to break down along two lines. One group of people says, these people, if they've come from a Muslim country, even three generations later can never be as French or as German as a white Christian citizen of those countries. Those people don't care about integration and are not committed to a pluralist society. Then there are conservatives who would argue, we need to reduce the numbers, we need to do a better job of integrating minorities, especially people coming from certain countries, and that requires fewer immigrants at a slower rate. That's an argument that I'm willing to have and that I think a lot of people on the left should be willing to have. But if it reverts to this ethnic nationalist argument and this notion that every Muslim is somehow a ticking time bomb, I think that that is both offensive and misleading, and it harkens back to some of the ugliest rhetoric in European history. And anyone who has studied European history and the scapegoating of minority religious groups should be very scared when they start to hear that sort of rhetoric. Christopher Hall, you were laughing listening to some of what uh, Sasha was saying there, but isn't this far simpler than, than we're actually even suggesting it is, that it isn't really about security. It isn't even about sort of securing the economic livelihood of people who are scared of immigrants coming in and taking their job. But it is, it is really what many people are saying, simply about making America white again, securing, uh, reinstating white hegemony. You know, it's, uh, it's fun to um, have people trying to deny reality when massive uh, majorities in all of these countries are embracing it. This is, that sort of statement is exactly the reason why people are getting sick of being called racist. Everybody who is, people are, okay, I would like to refer you to Laura Wilkerson. Laura Wilkerson's son, Josh, on November 16th, 20, uh, 2010, 
was murdered by a DACA-eligible illegal immigrant. He would have qualified for DACA. Laura Wilkerson's son is dead because of that kind of statement. The truth is that Americans are not racist and Europeans are not racist. What they are is they are not going to bring in people who have a completely different culture and whose culture is at war with theirs. But hold on, the but President Trump no, suggested no, no, no. that it's okay bringing people in from Norway, for example, but there are certain countries he wasn't well, quite fond of uh, well, I, who yeah, happened to be well, from a certain ethnicity. It's not because of the, their ethnicity, it's because of their culture. Look. In Europe, people are acknowledging that multiculturalism has failed. Multiculturalism is a disastrous idea. But what it is doesn't wrong with, work. What is wrong with Haitians then? Haitian workers who, for the majority, are employed by uh, Mar-a-Lago's uh, Trump estate, for example. So, so when it this suits is a you, it's all right different, This is a completely different argument. Economy. This is a completely different argument. Haitians are coming from one of the poorest, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere to the richest nation. They're going to have trouble. They're going to struggle. But what we need to be doing is we need to be choosing people who are going to make America stronger. We need to be choosing people that we can, who share our values. A lot of Americans are scared of immigrants taking their jobs away. Which they are. Should they be? Yes. Or should they be scared of robots coming in, artificial intelligence, and taking away these jobs and these livelihoods? We Something to we, think about. We I would rather think. have robots that don't kill us. All right, on this note, Christopher Hull, thank you very much indeed. And Sasha Polako Saransky in London, thank you very much indeed. So here in the United States, the wait for meaningful immigration reform goes on. The concern for many, though, is that change will mean this country is turning its back on a history written by immigrants. The president, a third generation immigrant whose grandfather came over from Germany, now wants to make it harder for families to bring relatives here. Official language has been rewritten. A key government website no longer refers to a nation of immigrants. And the future remains uncertain for hundreds of thousands of young, undocumented people who are protected, at least for now, by the courts. Not to mention the estimated 11 million undocumented migrants who live in fear each day of getting caught and being deported. From me, Rida Fakhri, and the entire team, thanks for watching.